So welcome everyone. My name is Elaine Garro and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, I live in Barrie, Ontario, situated on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek and the Wata First Nations, and as well as the historic, com uh, historic Métis communities in our region. I'm the co-chair of Great Lakes St. Lawrence Kairos region. Welcome to our first virtual um, fall forum and welcome uh, to the participants in this forum who are coming in from the Ontario Quebec region, but also to uh, participants from across Canada, from BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. I hope you'll be inspired by our speakers in the first hour on migrant justice and uh, by the many local projects uh, undertaken by speakers in the, in the second hour. Uh, this um, forum is uh, sponsored by the Great Lakes uh, St. Lawrence Coordinating Committee. And if you live in Ontario or Quebec and you do, don't see your region uh, represented on this committee, please uh, contact me. Uh, the wider the representation, uh, the, uh, the stronger we are. Before I introduce our first speaker, let's take a collective moment to uh, center ourselves and reflect on the lives of migrant workers and on migrant justice. This poem uh, was written by the Comboni missionaries uh, from the Philippines. Don't call me a stranger. I need to feel at home, especially when loneliness cools my heart. Don't call me a stranger. The soil we step on is the same, but mine is not the promised land. Don't call me a stranger. The color of my passport is different, but the color of our blood is the same. Don't call me a stranger. The language I speak sounds different, but the feelings it expresses are the same. Don't call me a stranger. I toil and struggle in your land and the sweat of our brows is the same. Don't call me a stranger. Borders, we created them and the separation that results is the same. Don't call me a stranger. I am just your friend, but you don't know me yet. Don't call me a stranger. We cry for justice and peace in different ways but our creator is the same. So in this uh, first hour, we'll hear from two speakers on the question of status for migrant farm workers. And during their presentations, I would invite you to uh, write any questions that you'd like to ask of the speakers in the chat box. Uh, please write the questions to me personally uh, to avoid filling up the chat box. And after both presentations, we'll have a chance to hear uh, their responses to, to your questions. So let me uh, first introduce to you uh, Shane Martinez. Shane is a Toronto-based uh, criminal defense and human rights lawyer and serves as pro bono legal counsel to the advocacy group Justice for Migrant Workers. Shane litigated the first successful human rights case of a migrant farm worker in Ontario, Monroe's versus Double Diamond Acres. Uh, in 2010, as an articling student on a rotation at Justice for Migrant Workers in Toronto, he met Adrian Monroe's, who had come to Canada under the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program and was fired and sent back to St. Lucia for complaining to management at the Double Diamond Acres tomato farm in Kingsville, Ontario, about racial slurs that he and his fellow workers were receiving on the farm. In 2013, Shane filled, a, filled out a, sorry, filed a complaint on his behalf with the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal and won. No migrant farm worker had ever won a case before the tribunal up to that point. Shane won the President Setter Award in 2019 for this case. 
Currently, Shane is representing 54 migrant farm workers in a mass application to the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario related to the racial profiling by the OPP uh, during a DNA sweep. Shane regularly lectures on transnational labor and migrant rights. And we discovered Shane's work upon reading uh, a piece he wrote for the Windsor Star. You'll find a link to the article in the chat box uh, at some point during, uh, during the call. Welcome, Shane, and thank you for agreeing to speak today. Thank, thank you very much for that nice introduction, Elaine. Uh, what I'm going to be speaking about today is uh, the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program specifically, uh, and also why it's important for migrant farm workers generally, but specifically those under that particular program to have access to permanent residency. And I'm going to explain some of the problems as well that arise uh, when workers don't have access to permanent residency. So we do know that farming is, has never been an easy business in Canada. Uh, it's characterized by dangerous work, long hours, low pay, and it's recognized as one of the most dangerous lines of work, in fact, that there is. Uh, but despite how important it is, uh, farm workers typically get very little recognition and very little respect. Uh, Many approaches have been tried by Canada over time to try and deal with deficiencies in terms of labor in the agricultural sector. Uh, originally, the Canadian government many years ago tried to bring workers in from Europe. Uh, that proved to be unsuccessful. They've also tried to have prisoners do the farm labor. They've tried to have people come off of First Nations reserves to do the labor, and they've tried to recruit uh, young people to do the labor. Um, all of those endeavors as well have been unsuccessful. So back in 1966, the Canadian government started uh, the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program, uh, relying on workers from Jamaica. The program was later expanded to include workers from Mexico, and today nearly all Ontario produce, uh, from tomatoes to apples, tobacco, it comes from migrant labor. Um, we've seen these farms in Tilsonburg, Simcoe, Leamington, all across Ontario and all across Canada. Um, and when we hear the jingles um, that are associated with the agricultural industry, for example, in Ontario, that good things grow here, good things grow in Ontario, we typically see you know, smiling white families in front of farms. Um, however, that's oftentimes very different um, from the individuals who are actually growing and harvesting the food that's brought to our tables. Uh, migrant farm workers, racialized workers, are the lifeblood of the agricultural industry in Canada, and they live a very different reality from that lived by farm owners. Uh, a large part of that is owing to their status in Canada, or rather their lack thereof. Uh, I'm going to endeavor to demonstrate this by relying on four arguments in support of migrant farm workers being provided uh, with an opportunity to attain permanent residence in Canada. First, separation from families. Uh, we know that workers under the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program come to Canada for eight months out of every year. Uh, some come here for years, even decades. Some workers have been coming up here from Jamaica for over 30 years. Uh, they've in fact spent more time here in Canada than they have back in their own home countries. However, they can't bring their families with them. Uh, when they come here to work and their families, in fact, uh, are not even permitted to come up and visit. Uh, workers that come here uh, by virtue of being here eight months out of the year are subjected to prolonged separation from their children and their spouses. And although financial support is positive and they have an opportunity to earn money to send back home, the distance takes a significant toll on the development of parent-child relationships and also the relationships between spouses. Being apart from children for such a long time is something that we would never want for ourselves. So we have to ask ourselves, why do we tolerate it for others? Permanent residence would facilitate family reunification. Uh, and that really keeps in line with one of the predominant legal principles in Canada, which is that we have to look to the best interests of children when we decide how we arrange certain affairs in our society. Uh, furthermore, um, the UN has something that's known as the International Convention on the Protection 
of the Rights of All Migrant Farm Workers and Members of Their Families. It's a very long name for this convention. Uh, specifically, Article 44 of it encourages the following, quote, states, parties recognizing that the family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and the state shall take appropriate measures to ensure the protection of the unity of the families of migrant workers. Although Canada is not a signatory to this convention, uh, I think we can take some guidance there uh, in realizing that our own domestic policy needs to be shaped by this overarching uh, concept of ensuring that families are united and they're not separated unnecessarily. Second, uh, migrant farm workers, when they come here to Canada under the seasonal program, they have no choice with respect to where they live. Workers who participate under the seasonal program are typically required to live in housing that's provided by their employers. Uh, and this housing is usually on the farms or very close to it. Um, now in rural areas, um, they're disconnected from the nearest towns and commercial centers. They're oftentimes, as we might say, in the middle of nowhere. Um, being from uh, New Brunswick, myself originally, I can attest to what it's like being in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I was certainly not as isolated as many workers are um, today. If you go to the most remote areas in Southern Ontario, you can find workers that have no ability to get themselves into town on their own. They're entirely reliant on their employers for transportation uh, to get into centers where they can do banking, buy food or other necessities. And this reliance can create an enhanced vulnerability in those working relationships where there's already a power imbalance. Uh, also, the pandemic has revealed some of the really deplorable conditions that many workers have to contend with year round. What we've seen in videos that have been leaked during the pandemic from, from certain farms and greenhouses is that workers are contending with overcrowded living spaces, infestations, substandard conditions of living. Uh, we've even seen videos of workers sleeping on mattresses that are laid out on wood, wooden pallets in warehouse settings. Uh, we've seen many bunk beds crammed into small rooms uh, and the bunk beds are simply separated by pieces of cardboard. This is in the midst of a pandemic, mind you, um, as a protection measure. Um, these kinds of arrangements as, as well also pose fire hazards, uh, overcrowding and whatnot. Uh, and we've seen firsthand that electrical problems can uh, lead to fires. One such fire happened in Brantford back in 2016 where dozens of workers lost all of their belongings and many of them also lost all of their savings because they were not keeping their money in banks, they were keeping their money in cash. When the bunkhouse burned down, they lost everything that they had. Now in Ontario, housing for seasonal agricultural workers is actually exempted from enforcement under the Residential Tenancies Act by virtue of it being, quote, living accommodation whose occupancy is conditional upon the occupant continuing to be employed on a farm, whether or not the accommodation is located on that farm. Permanent residence would enhance worker mobility and autonomy, and it would allow for workers to reside in places that they choose to reside in, as opposed to forcing them to reside in housing that's provided by an employer. Third, uh, workplace abuses and repatriation is also a consideration when we're looking at why migrant farm workers need permanent residence. I think it's perhaps uncontroversial that migrant farm workers are regular targets for abuse and exploitation. And this can be racial abuse, as was seen in the case of Adrian Monroe's, which was described. Or it can be sexual assault, as was seen in the Prestige Foods case from 2015, where two sisters from Mexico were sexually harassed and assaulted by their employer. Uh, or it can be racial profiling by the police, as was seen in the case that was also described that's still ongoing before the Human Rights Tribunal involving a DNA sweep that was conducted by the OPP in Tilsonburg, Ontario. I should note that that DNA sweep was facilitated uh, by the employer of these workers as well. So we can see there the nexus between the employer and the state and some of these uh, oppressive power dynamics. We also see cases such as that of uh, Luis Gabriel Flores Flores and Scotland Sweet Pack Growers. This was a case that's recently been in the news where a worker was awarded damages after the Ontario Labour Relations Board found that his employment 
uh, was wrongfully terminated after he spoke out about health and safety issues related to the spread of COVID-19. So whether it is inadequate training and safety equipment uh, or pesticide exposure, risks such as this, which have existed for years, uh, or something such as the pandemic, um, we see that repatriation can be a risk that workers face, but sometimes it can be far worse than that as well. Uh, what we know is that a worker named Ned Peart uh, was crushed to death uh, on a tobacco farm near Brantford, Ontario back in 2002. Um, we saw workers Paul Roach and Ralston White, they died in September of 2010 at Filsinger's Organic Foods um, as a result of being overcome uh, with fumes. This was a place that produced uh, products such as apple cider and vinegar as well. Um, we see vehicle accidents as well, overcrowded vehicles. There was an accident in 2011 where 11 migrant workers from Peru were killed when their van uh, careened off the road. And we also know that this year as well, three migrant farm workers from Mexico died uh, from COVID-19. Um, there's never been an inquest into the death of any migrant farm worker in Ontario. This is something that many people are pushing for and demanding is long overdue uh, so that we can have a very direct inquest into the conditions underlying uh, their presence here in Canada. And there's a culture of fear as well that prevents people from doing anything uh, when they encounter these types of problems in the workplace, it causes them to live in silence due to possible repatriations and being sent back home. That's a power that an employer has under the contracts, these seasonal contracts, is to send a worker home at any time for no reason whatsoever. They can state whatever their justification is to the liaison office. And so long as they give the liaison office notification that the person's being sent home, they can uh, be done with them. So it effectively prevents people from speaking up and raising concerns about what's happening in the workplace, knowing that they can be removed from the country at any time as occurred in the Adrian Monroe's case, again, that was referenced earlier. Permanent residence effectively removes the precarity that workers face. Uh, and it does this by no longer allowing them to be subjected to repatriations that are used as tools of reprisal. Uh, it removes the culture of fear and silence, which characterizes their existence here in Canada. And by doing so, this facilitates their access to justice when abuses arises. It allows them to have access to courts and tribunals and other mechanisms in the same way that we would if we encounter problems in our workplaces. And it also enables them to participate in a meaningful way in civil society at large. And that really takes us to the fourth argument in support of permanent residence, which is um, it's simply being a matter of dignity. If somebody is good enough to work, then it would stand to reason that they should be good enough to stay. They do the work that Canadians are unwilling to do, uh, even though we enjoy the literal fruits of their labor every day. They risk their lives growing and harvesting this food for us, and they sacrifice relationships with their families. They endure unimaginably difficult conditions, which we wouldn't tolerate for ourselves. And they don't deserve to live in isolation and invisibility, which oftentimes leads to these abuses and as well deaths. So I would say that basic human decency and compassion for our neighbors behooves us to call for their inclusion in our communities. And by doing so, we're able to take an important step towards fully respecting the immense contributions that they make to Canadian society. And that is essentially the position that I'm taking uh, with respect to why migrant farm workers uh, should be provided with an opportunity to attain permanent residence in Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shane. I uh, will call on Sherilyn Sprackman to uh, thank Shane on our behalf. Well, thank you, Elaine. And thank you, Shane. Thank you. Did anyone see me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> so my name is Sherilyn Sprackman, 
and I am co-regional chair of Great Lakes St. Lawrence with Elaine. And I thank you very much, Shane, for a, a, a very well um, reasoned argument, very well set out. I, I was taking notes because I'm thanking you and I wanted to be thorough in my thanking of you, but it's very reasoned um, reasons for uh, supporting our uh, farm workers, our temporary farm workers who come into Canada and really do um, provide us with so much of our food. Um, and the re and for, as you said at the end of your presentation, just to provide those people at the very least with the ba basic human rights and dig the dignity of being inclus included in, um, in Ontario. And there's farm workers in other provinces too, which we learned about listening to some of the presentations earlier this year from Kairos in uh, New Brunswick, Manitoba, there's farm workers also. So uh, thank you very much, Shane. That was excellent to hear your advice and, uh, <laughs> and being a lawyer and supporting these uh, temporary foreign workers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, and uh, again, I'd like to um, encourage all the participants to put any questions you have for Shane uh, in, uh, in the uh, chat box. And after the next uh, speaker, we'll, uh, we'll look at the questions uh, for both Shane and our migrant worker at the same time. I'd uh, now like to introduce Connie Sorio who is the Migrant Justice uh, Program Coordinator for Kairos Canada, and she'll introduce our next speaker. Um, thank you very much, Elaine. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Shane, for, you know, uh, for your presentation. Very, very informative. Um, as Elaine introduced me, I'm the Migrant Justice Coordinator at Kairos, and uh, we have a speaker with us this afternoon too that who's going to share her experience, you know, as a migrant worker. I just before I introduce her, I just want to to give a little bit of a you know an overview. Okay, not not a big overview, but just to mention that under the temporary foreign workers program, there are several you know. Uh, groups or sectors of workers. So the seasonal agricultural workers program is one of that, uh, that Shane has extensively shared with us. And under the two, or maybe just recently they took it away, but under the two was, you know, is the uh, caregivers uh, program. And we have the express entry program, the skills trade or uh, program, the international mobility program, and even the international students, you know, that we bring in here to Canada at some point is under the temporary foreign workers program because they are provided, you know, an open uh, an open work permit that they're allowed to work for twenty hours a week. Um, ours, and our, uh, our next speaker this afternoon is Marilyn Feigo. Marilyn, you know, uh, came to Canada under the caregiver program. Uh, she arrived in Canada last um, last September 2019 and uh, has gone through many uh, horrible uh, experiences under her former employer. And I would say uh, that continues with, you know, um, her, her, her current employer. Uh, Marilyn filed uh, a complaint with the Ministry of Labor under the, with the support of the Park Day Legal uh, Community Services, uh, won that case, and the employer is currently, you know, appealing the decision of the, uh, of uh, the Ministry of Labor. Um, Marilyn is a registered nurse in the Philippines before coming to Canada last year under the Caregiver uh, Pilot Program. Uh, Marilyn? Hi, so um, good afternoon, everyone. First, I would like to thank everyone for giving me the chance to partake in this forum. Um, it's truly an honor to speak with everyone here, um, especially on behalf of the caregivers here in Canada. So yeah, my name is Marilyn. I'm 33 years old. Um, 
single, never married, nor have kids. I'm just the breadwinner of my family in the Philippines. And Miss Connie is right. I'm a registered nurse back home and used to work as a mortgage banker in Chase Bank for nine years in the Philippines before I came here to Canada. Um, initially, I only came here um, to work um, as a living caregiver, um, hoping f- um, to have a better life and to further provide for my family back home and hopefully one day uh, uh, get them here and experience how beautiful it is here in Canada until I got um, abused and exploited by my previous employers. I used to um, work as a live-in caregiver and uh, at the family um, in Vaughan. Um, and then I was physically, emotionally, financially verbally abused by them um they've um violated everything that's on the contract they made me work 70 to 80 hours um a week including weekends and holidays without pay and sometimes if i would refer to my um to my contract they would tell me really you're asking us that well you know what the contract is just made for the sake of you um being here in canada that's really being disregarded by all employers so please stop asking us about the contract and the next time you ask us about that we're going to have you deported so me being silenced and um being intimidated by that statement i never ask um any questions about my situation anymore and everything that's on the contract but then they started calling me stupid um idiot drama queen like i i couldn't i i couldn't um help it and then i got um emotional a breakdown. I was so depressed. I wasn't eating anymore until I was rushed to the ER. And that day that I was rushed to the ER, um, they even told me that, hey, you have to pay us back that 100 that we gave you. And that moment that I was rushed to the ER, um, I took advantage of that moment to go to the Philippine embassy to seek for some help. And that was the only time I I found the courage to finally stand up for myself and fight for my right. And so I filed the case against them because they made illegal deductions as well from my salary. I've only been getting, technically, I've only been earning $3 per hour from what, from, um, from what they gave me. And despite of that they've been deducting money from me still for my plane ticket and for the third party agency that they've hired to process my work permit and um um just lucky i'm just lucky because um i got i won the case but they're still appealing so we'll see what's what's gonna happen next and now with my um current employers um I was granted a vulnerable open work permit by CIC, but then uh, they they didn't know, they weren't aware that technically I was already um, eligible and entitled to work um, by the time I got my open work permit, but then they've been, they were not remitting the taxes despite the deduction. So I had to pay for my own taxes just for me to be able to count those months because I need 24 months for my PR application. It was very tormenting for me because I don't have anybody here and I only came here to legally work. And um, have a better life, see the beauty of Canada, and provide more for my family back home. They never knew what what was happening to me until I won the case. So imagine those horrible things. I, I almost committed suicide and jumped out of the 11th floor of the building because it was really, really tormenting, and it was really horrible so there i really hope that all the caregivers who would come here just to work and have a better life 
would not go through the same thing that I've gone through. That's all. Thank you so much for this opportunity of being heard. God bless. Thank you, Marilyn. I'd like to introduce uh, Betty Ann um, Platt and ask her to thank uh, Marilyn on our behalf. Hello, everyone. My name is Betty Ann Platt, and I'm on the um, coordinating committee for um, Great Lakes St. Lawrence. Um, I would like to thank Marilyn for her um, her personal story that she that she shared with us. I'm sure it was very very difficult for her to um, let us know all of the difficult things that she has been going through, and um, I realized that it was it's very hard for her to do that. Um, but she has a great deal of strength to be able to do that. And um, I appreciate very much that she would share with us. I would like to um, wish her well in her ongoing struggles. And I know that she is not alone in, um, in how, how she has been treated and in her personal uh, story that there are many others. So uh, I wish, as I say, I wish her well and I thank her very much for sharing these very difficult stories with all of us. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, Marilyn, and thank you, Betty Ann. Um, I, I'd now uh, like to ask uh, the questions of our guests that participants have put in the uh, chat box. And uh, because I'm having technical difficulty and I can't figure out how to uh, show my PowerPoint and see my chat box at the same time, I am uh, going to uh, close down the, uh, the sharing option so that I can see people's questions um, and uh, ask uh, the questions of our guests. Elaine, do you mind if I choose one? Just sure. For go yeah, go ahead. There's a question, Shane, to you. How this is the big question. How can the average citizen help in your work to obtain permanent residence for migrant workers? Thanks for that. Um, I think one of the biggest things that people can do is to to voice their thoughts on the issue to their member of parliament. Um, I know that sometimes it, it seems as though that doesn't get a lot of traction, but I can tell you that based on what we know at Justice for Migrant Workers about what happens behind the scenes is that when people do contact their members of parliament and when you contact, for example, the parliamentary secretary to the immigration minister or the immigration minister directly, um, this does trigger discussions. Uh, and when people do it, on mass, um, it generates larger discussions. So I would definitely encourage people to reach out to elected officials uh, at the federal level and explain why this is absolutely essential and why there needs to be a mechanism in place for migrant farm workers to be able to attain permanent residence. If we're going to, <clears throat> excuse me, if we're gonna have systems in place that allow people to obtain permanent residence by investing money in Canada, effectively being able to purchase your way into the country, then we need to be able to recognize the contributions of migrant farm workers who are doing the most difficult and dangerous work, oftentimes over a prolonged period. And we need to ensure that they're treated with the respect that they're due. Uh, so definitely reaching out to elected officials would be, would be one way of doing that, especially if you're able to um, in a coordinated campaign with others so that you can stylize uh, your requests together and you can direct them. Uh, for example, you could target different politicians uh, different months. So one month you could perhaps send as a group letters to the parliamentary secretary to the immigration minister. The next month you could send them all to your own MPs and then you could find different targets uh, over a longer period of time and, and that will trigger attention. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. Uh, Connie, you wanted to ask a question? You're on mute. Hi. 
Hi, I just want to add to, you know, uh, Shane's uh, response. I'm sorry, I cannot find in my thing how to raise a hand. <laughs> um, anyway, just to, yeah, just to add uh, to what Shane said, uh, currently, there is a, a status for all status now campaign that the migrant uh, rights network uh, has launched since June and it is going ongoing at the moment. Kairos uh, is a signatory and is actively participating in that campaign. And uh, I just want to mention that as of uh, September 14th, where we had a press conference around on, on this campaign, 248 organizations have signed up, uh, signed on the letter uh, to the prime minister calling for, you know, granting status for all migrant workers who are here in Canada, including those who are undocumented and has lost their status uh, because of bureaucratic, you know, requirements. Of the 248 organizations, it represents about 8 million Canadians, you know, who are, you know, joining this campaign, calling actively for the Canadian government to, uh, to provide status uh, to all migrant workers, including, of course, Shane, the farm workers. Um, for caregivers, you know, like, uh, like Marilyn, this is very important. And as already mentioned before, status is very important in making sure that there is no discrimination, there is no, you know, an, an equal access to services, protection, and so forth. And, and so the, 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 the importance of, you know, supporting this campaign engaging members uh, of parliament and elected officials to support you know this campaign is very important yesterday kairos had a meeting with one with a member of parliament and this member of parliament is very very engaged and interested in supporting you know well he said uh there is no okay don't quote me but this is what you know he said that there is no support within the parliament to grant status for all. But they're open to looking at ways in providing status to, to some sectors or some of the workers. Um, last week, the Immigration and uh, Citizenship Minister uh, Marco Mendicino announced, you know, the increased levels in the immigration quota or targets for the next three years. And it accounts for about 1.2 million new newcomers who will be accepted here in Canada for the next three years. And he actually recognizes, you know, the temporary foreign workers who are here now in Canada should be able to, to access this and become permanent residents and later on, you know, become citizens. I can send you a link, you know, to that announcement so that we can use that, you know, as a basis in, in meeting with MPs and supporting this call. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Uh, one of the questions I received uh, privately, Shane, what are the political lobbies out there that are opposing permanent residency? Um, are, do you have any idea of the percentage of um, votes in rural ridings? Um, I think the person here is referring to the percentage of um, perhaps of MPs that might be for or against um, granting uh, status for all and the uh, possible issues in provincial and federal elections. Mm, okay, great questions. Uh, based on my experience, I, what I can tell you is that uh, su support for status is oftentimes drawn along the predictable party lines, uh, which you're all likely familiar with and can use your imaginations on about who's in support of status, who's not, and who is uh, kind of sitting on the fence. Um, what I can tell you is that in terms of lobbyists and uh, entities that are opposed to it, although they don't necessarily come out and, and say that they're opposed to it, one of the organizations that uh, benefits from workers having precarious status and being, as some people would say, permanently temporary, is an organization called Farms. And uh, Farms is the, uh, it's effectively an employer organization for farms and greenhouses here in Canada. Um, 
It represents the agricultural industry. Uh, I, I should say specifically, not in Canada, but in Ontario. Uh, it represents the Ontario agricultural industry uh, in, in its dealings with both the provincial and federal governments. And it also uh, participates in the negotiation of contracts uh, that govern the program. So one thing that's important to keep in mind is who has a seat at the table? Who benefits from workers being kept permanently temporary? So we have to look at who has a voice. Who, who is drafting these contracts that allows employers to repatriate workers at any time? That, that provides no pathway for workers to ever be able to apply for permanent residence in Canada? Well, it is the Canadian government. It's the governments of the sending countries, so the countries that the workers are coming from. And it's also the organizational representative of the employers. So the employers have a seat at the table, the sending countries do, and the Canadian government does. Who does not have a seat at the table? The workers, right? The farm workers don't have a seat there. One of the reasons why they don't have a seat there, at least in Ontario, is because in Ontario, farm workers cannot legally unionize. They have no right to collectively bargain here in this province. You can imagine how that accelerates their vulnerability and increases the dangers that they're faced with when they cannot actually have their voices heard. So at, at the end of the day, uh, employers and the state, whether it's here or abroad, everyone seems to have uh, an interest and a benefit in workers being kept temporary. Uh, the law and the way that these things are structured is not by accident. Uh, it's not a mistake. Um, it's not that they're short-sighted. Um, there are benefits here um, that are gleaned by, by certain entities and by the state. And it's only by allowing migrant workers to have a voice and helping to facilitate and amplify their voice and act as allies for them that we can make sure um, that the contracts are changed and ultimately that legislation is changed to allow them to, to have that opportunity to attain residence here in Canada. Thank you, Shane. Uh, I'll, I'd like to combine two questions here. Has anyone done any research on how much the cost of food would rise if we began to pay living wages under decent conditions to, um, to migrant workers? And what guidelines are in place for salary and wages for migrant workers in Ontario? So, um, so I guess to deal with the, the wage question first, uh, for migrant farm workers, uh, and, and my comments are, are specifically with respect to, to farm workers, as I think you've probably gathered by now, there's other types of migrant workers as well. Um, but in terms of migrant farm workers uh, in Ontario, typically uh, it's minimum wage. Um, it's, it's almost always minimum wage, and that's whether you've worked here for a year, if it's your first season, or if you've been coming here for over 20 years, right? Um, and there's a great saying about minimum wage uh, from a comedian uh, named Chris Rock, which is, you know, minimum wage is an employer's way of saying that they would pay you less if they could, but it's illegal. Right? So uh, we see that, you know, we see such little respect that's given to the workers that despite the you know, fact that you can give decades of your life to an employer, they'll still continue to pay you minimum wage. With respect to the increase uh, in the cost of food, I think we have to ask ourselves, um, why should there be an increase at all? This is a, a multi-billion dollar industry. It's extremely profitable. Um, these, these are not uh, some, you know, what we're, what we're sold oftentimes is this concept of the, the traditional family farm. And, and, you know, what existed 50 years ago, 60 years ago and more is not the reality that exists today. Uh, are there still some small family farms? Certainly that there are, um, but those are the exceptions. Um, by and large, uh, it is large corporate bodies which operate these agricultural uh, operations, um, massive um, uh, farming companies that have millions and millions of dollars in profits. And as I said, as an industry, uh, billions. So we'd have to ask ourselves, well, why are the costs going up? Because they want to maintain their profit margins. Um, you know, so I think we need to direct our, our critiques and our, our analysis there at, at the, in the proper direction, which would be at the employers um, if the cost goes up. And of course, you know, the state always has the ability to step in and attempt to regulate this. And there's, there's many 
many ways that they have at their disposal to try and make sure that the cost of food doesn't increase uh, uh, unreasonably. Okay, thank you, Shane. Um, there, you know, people are asking how they can help if there's, uh, of course, one of the ways they can help is to join the uh, Status for All campaign that Kairos has uh, going on. And uh, perhaps Connie, you can put the link in the chat box for the Status for All campaign. Uh, also, if you want to learn more about uh, migrant rights, there are two PowerPoint presentations that Kairos has. And I believe Shannon is going to put a link uh, in the chat box for those. Uh, Shane, they ask also if there's a template for letter writing that that uh, you could share or, or ways, other ways that people can uh, help um, for farm workers. But also I see that many people were moved by Marilyn's presentation and, and are asking about how they can help uh, Marilyn. So maybe Connie can speak to that after uh, you do, Shane. Sure. Um, with respect to, to letters, um, yes, uh, there are templates and, and I can certainly provide those to you, Elaine, if, if you're able to distribute those to the group. Uh, Justice sure. for Migrant Workers does have letters like that. Um, I, I'll just note as well in the chat window, a couple messages were sent to me privately. One was from uh, Peter Besson in New Brunswick, a fellow New Brunswicker, so I'll just say greetings to him uh, there. And also there was a, there was a question as well um, from Russell which was, uh, do farmers hire both foreign and local workers to work together? Uh, yes, they do uh, on occasion. Um, employers are required to first try and fill the jobs here um, before obtaining a labor market opinion to prove to the government that they can't fill the jobs here and that they're required to hire uh, uh, using individuals from abroad. Um, so uh, occasionally some positions are filled with, with workers here, but oftentimes in these larger operations, especially, and even in the smaller ones, most of the workers are uh, foreign workers. Okay, and Connie, did you want to speak to how uh, people can help uh, Marilyn and people in Marilyn's situation? Um, thank you for, for, for asking and the interest of helping. Um, if you visit, you know, the Kairos website, we have there uh, the information and ways of being able to uh, support migrant workers like Marilyn. Um, we also have uh, workshop guides in terms of facilitating relationship between, you know, allies, community organizations, community folks uh, with migrant workers in, in, in their local communities. Uh, specific to, you know, to caregivers uh, situation like Marilyn's, um, actually this shouldn't happen anymore. There has been some changes in the program where, you know, um, um, migrant work, Marilyn should be able to come under an open work permit and be able to bring her family, her spouse and her children. And she should, she is automatically assessed, you know, as a permanent resident, but required to finish the 24 months before, you know, that transition happens from caregiver to a permanent resident. And I think we just need to keep the government reminding, uh, reminding them that, you know, we already have this in place. This should be followed up. And if there is a need for inspection and monitoring, then let's put that in place. So migrant workers, temporary workers, or caregivers like Marilyn would stop experiencing, you know, this horrible uh, treatment and, and so forth. I, I also want to mention that, you know, um, there is already this uh, program again that the government introduced late last year, where workers who are exploited can go to IRCC and file a complaint and they are given uh, an open work permit to be able to leave that abusive, you know, employer. And this is what they call the uh, open work permit for vulnerable workers. But again, the honors, you know, is on the workers to be able to provide evidence or proof that they are being abused and exploited. And many of the workers would not do that because they are afraid that, you know, 
uh, IRCC would deem their claim not sufficient and they are forced to go back to their employer and the more abuse and exploitation uh, they, would, uh, they would experience. And this is where, you know, the importance of this status for all campaigns about. Like we're not, you know, we're not delineating or we're not, you know, separating or dividing who should get permanent presidency and who should not. Because already the government is doing that. And our role, I guess, as, you know, concerned um, citizens and members of Kairos is to demand that everybody should be treated equally in the same way that workers who are from other countries should be treated in the same way that local workers are treated. They should have access to the same rights and services and they should have, you know, they should be treated with, you know, dignity and human rights perspective. Thank you, Connie. There is a, another question here for you, Shane, uh, about follow-up. What kind of follow-ups are in place to ensure that um, employers are, are being, um, are treating their workers uh, correctly? So I, I presume that's in reference to follow-ups after a complaint has been made? Uh, Maybe um, it doesn't say in the question. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there are uh, sometimes uh, surprise inspections uh, by the government. Unfortunately, the uh, surprise element is oftentimes absent. We hear from a lot of workers that employers will catch wind of when an inspector is coming by and they'll immediately direct the workers to clean certain things up, to not work in certain areas. Um, uh, it, it seems as though there needs to be some significant uh, improvements in terms of how inspections are made so to ensure that they are actually legitimately surprise inspections. Um, you know, we've also seen situations where uh, some employers, uh, after they've been caught uh, breaking the law, go right back to the same behavior a year or two later. Um, one of the issues is that uh, the government is potentially not creating consequences that will prompt behavior modification on the part of employers. Um, why should employers be allowed to continue to hire migrant workers and make, as I mentioned, millions and millions of dollars in profits if they're not willing to respect the law and abide by it and respect the rights of, of the workers who come here? It, it's a difficult question about, you know, what kind of follow-up exists there. Right now, there's, there's not a lot. And for that reason, um, in fact, a lot of the enforcement and uh, raising of awareness and trying to push consequences on employers is coming from grassroots organizations more than actually from the state. Um, that seems to be the reality right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I, uh, I'd like to, to thank everyone for your questions. If uh, we weren't able to get to your questions, uh, we'll um, try to get back to you privately um, to see what uh, to see what answers we can get for you uh, from Shane. Um, and uh, on that note, I'd like to again uh, thank uh, Shane and Marilyn for sharing their wisdom with us today on uh, this really complex issue, and um, hope to see some. Uh, that, that is the silver lining of COVID is perhaps that uh, we're focusing in on some issues uh, more, um, more pointedly and we can see real change take place. Thank you again. And uh, we, uh, we could now move to uh, our second hour. And I will again uh, share the screen, my screen with you. So um, in this uh, second hour, we'll hear from people from uh, across uh, the Great Lakes St. Lawrence uh, region who devote time, energy, uh, and passion to social justice projects that speak to people in their uh, localities. Um, 
we'll uh, hear uh, from each of these speakers in a, a roundtable format. And as in the first hour, I'd invite you to write your questions for the speakers in the chat box. And uh, after all eight uh, people have had a chance to speak, uh, then we can have a round of questions. Um, we've also reserved some time at the end for Shannon Neufeld, who's our network coordinator at Kairos Canada to make some national announcements. Um, so uh, let's uh, begin with uh, Dave uh, Gordon in Aurora, Ontario. Uh, thank you. Um, it's been about a decade of social justice activism, uh, working with a water project in the um, uh, Niski Aski Nation and the place is Bikanjikum. Bikanjikum paid the news uh, internationally as the youth suicide capital of the world. And in 2010, in answer to the deputy coroner's report, the chief at the time, Gordon Peters, um, answered uh, the coroner's report with projects that would uh, help uh, bring uh, the community to health. And uh, one of those projects was water, running water in the homes of the most vulnerable. So parallel to that, uh, the Diocese of Toronto at an outreach conference had our uh, National Indigenous Bishop uh, give a workshop. And after that workshop, a few of us uh, talked to the bishop and said, what can we do? And parallel to this was a group of engineers, Bob White and Dave Steves, who were working with the coroner to address some of these projects that uh, Chief Gordon Peters had created. Project number one was on the hydro grid of Ontario. Number two was water. So we started with raising money for water and we aligned ourselves with the United Churches, um, Reverend uh, Dr. Charles Cato, who was the founder of um, Frontier Foundations, which had already built homes uh, for the Cree in Northern Quebec. And we, too, we needed a technical guy on the ground to uh, train uh, young adults in electrician, plumber and uh, carpenter to retrofit these homes. We, we raised uh, sufficient money to, for phase one and phase two. And then using political suasion, we embarrassed the Honorable uh, Carolyn Bennett to meet what the Anglican Church of Canada did. And they, phase three was accomplished by uh, 336,000 um, investment by the government of Canada. Going through the, the development, uh, we always had trouble with having an oversight manager make sure these young uh, people in the trades were doing things properly and had a, a licensed ticket to sign off as a product is, was safe. Forest fires they slowed uh, two building periods down and we're now at the point of phases four and five uh, being completed after COVID sometime in the future. We were so successful in raising money that we became an embarrassment to CRA and the Anglican Church. Right now, there's $550,000 uh, waiting for faces four and five, and CRA are really getting irritated because it's sitting there not being invested in what people had given it for. So we're taking a, a pivot and we have now, as of uh, less than a month ago, signed a, a memorandum of understanding between another NGO, Water First Education and Training Incorporated of Cremor, uh, and the uh, public, uh, the Private World Relief and Development Fund, which is the banker for the National Church. We will be working uh, at arm's length, and Water First will be making all the relations and building uh, uh, trust with the uh, tribal councils to uh, train young men and ladies uh, who want to be trained as water systems operators, water quality analysis, sanitation systems operators. It's 
going to take 15 months of apprenticeship. We, we've uh, char- charged it out at $5,000 a month per person, and we're raising money to uh, that effect. And we're investing in people because we've now found since Water First has been doing this, everybody's had opportunity for a career job and staying in their community with their family. So it's a new way of looking at things. First, we looked at investing in, in stuff like uh, water systems, but now we're investing in uh, human beings, which is probably uh, more to what we, sh- we should be doing as a, a faith group. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Dave, for that. Our next speaker is Nancy Labonté from Montreal, Quebec. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> so I'm going to speak about Roger, but first I want to present myself. I'm Nancy Labonté. I'm an active member of the feminist Christian collective, L'Autre Parole, The Other Word which is my church, or if you prefer my ecclesia. I'm also a coordinator of the Action of Christians for the Abolition of Torture, ACAT Canada, and a member of the steering committee of the Ecumenical Justice, Ecology and Peace Network called ROJEP. I have a master degree in practical theology, which focused on a theology on the threshold of religion. So um, the Rojep history began in December 97 during a meeting with the Ecumenical Coalition of Toronto and Sergio Torres, theologian of the Latin American Amerindia Network, that several groups decided to form the Quebec Network on the Jubilee. This network was then made up of 25 Christian groups. From 98 to 2000, three major campaigns focusing on the themes of the Jubilee and focused on the remission of the external debt of the poorest countries were carried out and resulted in extraordinary mobilizations around across the country. But it is in January 2002 in Montreal that more than 35 Christian groups confirmed that the network must be a place of consultation, reflection, and exchange to promote the theological and spiritual perspective that places commitment to justice at the heart of the Christian faith. It was therefore decided that the, this network would have an open structure while, while supporting the broader commitment of Christian groups working for justice, peace, and the integrity of creation in the wake of the biblical jury. The Rojep does not want to overlap with existing groups, but to be at their service by promoting networking that is both flexible and effective. In conclusion, we help to increase the capacity to act according to our Christian faith. Several types of engagement make up the network of an average of 30 groups from different churches. Feminist group organization for helping migrant farm farm workers in Quebec, others for social or ecological justice, for dialogue between natives and Quebecer, or for social reconstruction and so on. Our social Christianism aims to growing together within a contextual theology that is built to include non-theologians in the analysis of our time in the light of the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much, Nancy. You're welcome, Elaine. Our next uh, speaker is Kathleen Lichty from uh, London, Ontario. I was asked to to share um, how I got involved in the blanket exercise in the, in the teaching and sharing circles and to explain a little bit about what that is. Well, I am a sister of St. Joseph in Canada. I live in London on the territory really of the um, the uh, First Nations communities here are the Chippewa of the Thames, the Oneida First Nation um, from and Mon- from Moravian town and the Muncie Delaware. And uh, I've become friends with three of these women and I'll explain that in a minute 
but what what really impelled me to get involved in the blanket exercise was after my near-death experience I knew that my life wasn't over I mean I'm no young chick anymore and um, I nearly checked out so the fact that I that I came back literally and I made a conference in 2014 I believe uh, it matters to us. And I made my first blanket exercise and I was really moved by Murray Sinclair. Um, his, his statement about it's education that got us into this mess and it's education that will get us out of it. Now, I am a retired teacher. I think I'm retreaded at this point. Mm. And, and the, the whole doctrine of discovery and, and what, what has been done to the, to the First Nations people in the belief that they are inferior that they believe that of themselves and certainly the Europeans believe that of them. And that's uh, that behavior was embodied in so many ways. So my personal involvement was um, after this conference, I got training to be a Kairos uh, facilitator and I partnered and I actually in about 11 months, I think I did about 65 blanket exercises and mentored other facilitators worked closely with, with Kairos, and then uh, partnered with local organizers in London, um, Pillar Nonprofit, uh, and also requests that came from Kairos. And I, I also assisted in coordinating teams in the area, London area. Now with COVID, with the arrival of COVID, it's been a grace in disguise, because here anyway, the, the blanket exercise is kind of on hold um, in June of 2020, um, there were three teaching and sharing circles that were held here. And it was at the initiation of three Indigenous women with whom I had worked very closely in presenting blanket exercises. And they came to me and said, how, how could we do a sharing circle? And I said, well, hey, let's talk about it. And I said, this is your baby, you're gonna do it. Uh, and I'll support you in any way. And I, I did take out a Zoom account. I learned how to do Zoom and I said, I can provide you with the platform, you do it. And so what we do, and here I want you to show you these three women. Uh, I've got them up here. There it is, can you see it? Uh, we, we see a document. Okay, now that is, um, Marianne Cachego, and as you can see on there, it, they are two, two, two hour Zoom based interactive sessions led by an experienced Kairos blanket exerciser, indigenous facilitator or knowledge keeper. It is $25 to be self sustainable and registrations now are done through Kairos. Uh, Marianne has done the two row wampum belt treaty and these, we found that they, they are more uh, available to people in the evening, seven to nine. Um, this uh, November 24th, Tina Stevens is going to be doing a presentation on the social injustice in the court system. And Tina works at the courthouse. So she speaks from her own experience as does Marianne from her own experience. Tracy uh, White Eye, uh, is working on her master's in uh, social work with the indigenous people. Uh, she, she, said, she says she's a woman health helper and um, just passionate about these teaching and sharing circles. Um, all of these women, this is their second teaching and sharing circle. Um, because we're limiting the numbers to 35 to 40 people, uh, we've got a waiting list. We've had a waiting list after each one of these. So I can't say enough about these three women other than, uh, wait a minute, I got something else here. In my experience in working with them, not only do they walk the talk, but in these sharing and teaching circles, they talk the walk. They can speak from their own experience because they have walked the journey through colonialism and can, can you continue to do that they are not grinding an axe although they have every reason to they've done their homework their personal growth 
they're not speaking out of anger. They're speaking out of truth. The truth that got us into this, that's going to get us out of this mess. And all I can say is, for these three women, I got their permission. I said, I want to, I want to brag about you. May I have your permission? And they said, so I told them what I was going to say. <laughs> One of them started to cry. I said, well, you're a big help. <laughs> but I just want you to know that I can't tell you what these teaching and sharing circles have done, not only for these three women, but for the people that are involved in these circles. It's an engaging thing. The sharing circle is led by the Indigenous person, and she invites the person to share. Um, and the question that's asked is, how do you feel about what you just heard? And their presentation is about maybe 30 to 40 minutes, and then the sharing. Um, it begins with a land acknowledgement, a virtual smudge, um, and then the knowledge keeper or the Indigenous facilitator takes over. And so what I say of them is you stoke the fires of creativity with humility, gratitude, and awareness. You need to ask for the gift to be directed. And that's what we continue to say to the creator. Where do you lead us next? Writing, and I put in there storytelling, is a spiritual process. To be a creator, you need to connect with the creator. And, I, and that's a quote from uh, Richard Wakamese and Embers. But what I, what I want to stress, uh, are we back on normal view? Yes. Okay. <laughs> what I want to stress with, with this is that these women, um, because they work through their own stuff, they don't turn people off at all. They engage. They truly engage people because they speak from heart to heart and so I'm very grateful to them for my experience in working with them and um, I've learned so much so thanks a lot for uh, the opportunity to share this with you it, it's it's extremely exciting and it's it's just something that's really taking off thank you so much Kathleen mm -hmm. our, our next speaker is Elizabeth Snell from Guelph Ontario Hi. Um, in 2017, Kairos Guelph uh, started a three-year public film series on Indigenous rights issue. We, we called it Winds of Change, which is the Kairos theme that, uh, from Kairos Canada. And the idea was to contribute to the relationship building between settler and Indigenous members of the Guelph community. We picked a film per year on a topic we felt uh, contributed to improved understanding. Publicized it through bulletin announcements and posters uh, to all the Guelph area churches and posters in libraries and other and to uh, press releases to local media, uh, digital posters to our uh, local indigenous leaders and um, other contacts, University of Guelph. So, uh, we applied for and received $1,000 from the United Church Justice and Reconciliation Fund to help with expenses so over the three years and the events were free. We showed the films at one venue, a uh, centrally located Anglican Church Hall. And each evening there was territorial acknowledgement and smudging um, and refreshments. The films were after the last river, a moving film about various issues in Ottawa-Piscot. Then the second year was Reserve 107, which is an area in Saskatchewan with a farm community and a local Indigenous tribe. And it, it uh, tells a very positive story about uh, growing understanding and mutual respect and appreciation of the uh, joint treaty responsibility to, to, for the health of the land. And the third year was uh, Doctrine of Discovery, Stolen Land, Strong Hearts, which is a challenging and informative documentary about the, uh, this 500 year old doctrine and its devastating and ongoing uh, legacy. We tried 
various ways of discussion afterwards. There was both a Q&A format with a, uh, an indigenous, uh, local indigenous pro uh, professor on water and land resource issues. And then another way we found good, we wanted to get to circle discussion. So say with the doctrine of discovery, we um, asked the attendees to reflect on the film based on four uh, short questions, each on a flip chart. Uh, so they would go spend a few minutes circulating and putting their comments there on this flip chart and then choose one. And there were, so there are four uh, sharing circles, one around each question. So that worked really well. And there's a lot of great input in a, in a relatively short uh, time. Um, we, we want to continue though, the three years are up. And so this year though, we're a bit stymied by our minimal technological knowledge. <clears throat> so we haven't quite sorted out how to do it. But anyways, we're working on it and we've got a couple of options. One is gently whispering the circle back, which is a stories of residential school trauma, both the victim, direct victims and the following generational ones and their journeys of healing. And the second idea was a set of three very short videos on indigenous wisdom and worldviews that offer guidance on current issues. So we have one on climate change collaboration and one on our responsibility to the earth and one on indigenous principles of learning, which all three are very positive and informative and inspiring. In both cases, we'd be hoping to invite a indigenous commentator as part of it. So the outcome we had about 40, 50, well, 40 to 80 attendees, I guess, in those three events, both indigenous and settler. Um, we feel the films and the discussion really did expand understanding and, and increase awareness of historic and current injustices. Offered some roots for reconciliation and gave the opportunity for the Indigenous and settler community members in Guelph to interact on these important issues. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I see that someone in the chat box asked if you could list the films uh, that you just described uh, for them. Um, our next speaker is uh, Ruth, uh, Ruth McDonald from Barrie, Ontario. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm really uh, glad to be able to share about the listening post in Barrie. Uh, it is my passion. And uh, um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, we are a group of volunteers uh, who create spaces for that are safe for people to be heard one-on-one uh, -on -one with respect and compassion and in confidentiality. And we create those spaces by having um, relationships built with community partners. Um, so back in 2019, in uh, January of 2019, we started and started from ground zero and had to develop relationships in the community. And we started with uh, our local um, shelter for people experiencing homelessness. And uh, so that was kind of the vision to start with uh, people who are on the margins and listening with them. And so uh, we started uh, listening there. Uh, it's called the Busby Centre. And uh, we have volunteers that go in and we have shifts. Uh, we had two shifts per week uh, before COVID uh, started. And then uh, we couldn't go in there anymore. But uh, then we started with um, a relationship with the, the library, which is a little bit more public public space, which was very exciting for us to uh, receive approval to uh, have a listening post there as well. And uh, since COVID, we have, uh, we took a break being trying to be safe. And then we realized that we could probably get back and listen at a distance with face masks. And so we have, and we're at two uh, emergency shelters right now. Uh, we're um, 
have a pilot project going with the Elizabeth Fry Society, uh, with the women who are staying at the uh, emergency shelter uh, in Barrie. And we um, have start, since started back at the library as well. So um, since 2019, uh, we started in May uh, with an actual listening post, but I have trained uh, about 21 people as listeners. Currently, uh, right now, we have about uh, 10 of them that are active. We've been experience, ex experimenting in uh, uh since COVID with telephone listening or online listening, but really the key is face to face. And uh, that creates that safe sense of uh, people um, uh, that people need to be able to share their story. Uh, one of the other things we do is we do free pop-up listening. So if you drove downtown Barrie, you might see us out uh, standing with signs that say free listening and we just stand there and honestly people do come up and and want to be heard uh, or sometimes they just are interested in what we do and so we tell them and I think it's just a wonderful uh, way to stand up in a public space and advocate for uh, the importance of people being heard um, and being a listening presence in a sense, uh, we could say we just listen. And that has two meanings. Uh, yes, we are just listening. We are not trying to fix anybody. We are not trying to uh, solve any issues. We are not trying to uh, do any uh, referrals for anyone. We are simply trying to understand and fully be present to them. So... Uh, I think I better stop there. I don't know how long I could go on forever. <laughs> it is my passion. Thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, next speaker is Jan O'Hearn from uh, Toronto. Hi, folks. Um, I get the sense that I'm the, I'm the newest to the fold or one of the newest to the Kairos family. Uh, I have been kind of on the periphery of Kairos um, for a number of years as a participant, but uh, chose to join a local chapter uh, at the beginning of this year. And um, so I'm not, you know, I'm not, hmm, I'm not confident in uh, what the history of the group has been. I can only tell you where we're at at this point. Um, a big part has been uh, transitioning during COVID to uh, reaching a community online rather than in person, which has been, you know, the group's history. Uh, what we have uh, done to date is partnered with um, an organization called Canadian Friends of Sibyl, which is a Christian ecumenical organization that is specifically focused on supporting uh, the Palestinian community, uh, both in Palestine and the diaspora. This is a, um, a cause that's very close to my heart and what actually brought me to Kairos. So uh, our chapter had uh, committed to participating in a speaking tour for a particular uh, Palestinian Christian farmer um, that ended up being an online event that took place uh, November 7th and was well attended. We had 140 people, as I say, we as Kairos Toronto West can't take credit for that, but we did support it. And I think that that's probably uh, how we'll be moving forward uh, in the near future is partnering with other uh, groups and organizations uh, to gain a little bit of traction for an online presence. Um, now, this particular project in Palestine um, is called Tent of Nations. As I say, uh, Tent of Nations is a peace uh, center that is founded by a Christian Palestinian family who uh, have been farming uh, a, 
a 100 acre farm on the outskirts of Bethlehem for the past uh, 104 years. Now, as you can imagine, under uh, the occupation, um, land confiscation is an ongoing thing. And uh, that is the kind of primary preoccupation of uh, the Nasser family right now. But their, their mission essentially is to, um, to stand confidently and steadfastly in resistance to uh, colonization and occupation and to do it uh, from a place of, of Christian witness, which is founded in justice and peace and uh, nonviolent resistance. So that really resonates, not just for myself, but I think uh, many people in uh, our various communities and uh, what we foresee in the future as a, a Kairos chapter is exploring the commonalities and the bridges that can be built uh, with regards to Indigenous land rights uh, closer to home, but also in support of uh, Tenta Nations and the broader Palestinian community. Thanks. Thank you, Jan. I don't think you have to apologize for being new to Kairos because we're, we're all uh, at different stages of, of being with Kairos and uh, Kairos is welcoming of uh, all people doing social justice work. Our next speaker is Dorothy Wilson from New Hamburg, Ontario. Hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, Elaine has asked me to, uh, to speak about uh, a working group that we have uh, here in this community. And uh, it's actually got a long uh, name. It's called the uh, uh, Wilmot Ecumenical Working Group on Indigenous Settler Issues. And uh, it actually uh, started uh, um, back in 2017 when uh, uh, some uh, local um, participants, uh, local uh, members of the, the ministerial uh, decided that uh, the churches should try and do something to respond to the uh, uh, results of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And uh, so, um, uh, two ministers, uh, an Anglican and a, a Lutheran, uh, kind of spearheaded this and got some other people uh, involved. And uh, so uh, the first activity that this group did was a community blanket exercise, and that took place in November of 2017. And uh, I actually got involved with the group uh, probably a month or so before that as the representative from the local United Church. Uh, we had about 80 people uh, from the community attend this blanket exercise and we were really uh, thrilled with the response that we had. So the next thing that we uh, decided to do, uh, one of our uh, members had heard about this play called Discovery a Comic Lament um, that uh, focuses on uh, the doctrine of discovery and uh, the people that uh, uh, did this play were from the States. So uh, we needed to uh, work with other people to be able to afford to bring these people to our community. And uh, there was a good response from other groups in the Waterloo region. So uh, the, the, um, the actors, uh, uh, there were, uh, two or three people came and uh, the play was presented in four different locations in uh, Waterloo region, including in our own community where we had about 300 people attend at the venue uh, locally. Uh, so uh, after that, we were uh, kind of debating what we were going to do next, but uh, one of our um, uh, members uh, had been in some discussions with the executive director of a local service, social service agency here uh, called the Wilmot Family Resource Center, and uh, she had uh, uh, a desire to uh, hire a part-time Indigenous elder uh, for their agency. Uh, to provide uh, support, uh, um, in particular, uh, uh, supporting uh, women that uh, uh, were affected by family violence, but also to, uh, to, uh, work, to be available to, uh, to advise and support with other programming that they did. So uh, 
Um, I just should uh, back up for a minute and say that Wilmot is actually uh, uh, our bigger community. Uh, it's uh, a rural township on the west side of Waterloo Region that's made up of a, a number of uh, small municipalities and, and uh, New Hamburg is probably the largest of those uh, of those municipalities and our group has uh, uh, people from New Hamburg and from Baden which is another community in, in the township. Anyways uh, we decided that uh, our group decided that we could uh, help out with this initiative of, uh, uh, of getting a, an Indigenous elder uh, uh, being hired for the resource center and um, the resource center had some funding that they could put towards this that they could uh, pull from their family uh, violence program, but they uh, they were going to need uh, you know several thousand dollars uh, in addition to that to uh, hire this person on a part time basis. So uh, we decided uh, initially to have a couple of events where we could educate the community about this initiative and uh, also. Uh, uh, try and, and uh, solicit some funding to support this initiative. And the first thing we did was uh, last January, we uh, showed the Philom Indian horse and um, we had over 65 people attend that. Um, we, had tried to, we had tried to get uh, an indigenous uh, person to be available uh, for the uh, follow-up discussion, but we didn't have uh, very good life, luck. And act the night that uh, the uh, event took place, this woman and her daughter showed up that were indigenous and they're uh, from Kitchener, but they were friends of uh, uh, people from one of the churches that's involved in our group. And uh, they just, you know, uh, particularly the daughter, the adult daughter added so much uh, to our uh, um, discussion after, and she's actually uh, become involved with a, uh, a task group at the Lutheran church uh, since then. Anyways, that was a good event and uh, we had quite a, few, quite a few people made donations. Um, we decided to uh, have a second event that took place about a month later where we uh, um, had a, a newly retired historian uh, that lives locally and, and uh, he had uh, worked at the Waterloo Region uh, Museum before he retired. And uh, his talk was called, They Never Taught Us This in School. And uh, it was actually a, an excellent presentation that uh, talked about the existence of, uh, well, not just the existence, but about the, uh, the life of indigenous people in our area uh, before the settlers arrived. And, and uh, you know, the, the, um, the level of organization of, of these communities that was uh, quite amazing. And, and uh, there've been a lot of artifacts that have been found in this area that have sort of corroborated uh, sort of the, uh, the history of, of what life was like uh, prior to uh, the Europeans arriving. So anyway, we had plans of course to do some other things, but uh, COVID kind of got in the way of that. Uh, but uh, the next thing that uh, uh, we decided to do, and we, uh, we had had some, uh, uh, some discussions with one of the local municipal councillors, and uh, she uh, suggested that we make a presentation to our township council uh, to inform them about the initiative and, and uh, with the goal of, of uh, trying to get them to, uh, to give some funding towards it as well. So uh, in uh, September, we, uh, we did a presentation um, for the council and uh, um, we, uh, um, it was fairly well received. Um, we had the idea that we were going to meet with them again later in the fall to actually uh, give the, the hard ask for money. But uh, um, one of the um, uh, township staff suggested that uh, an application be made for a grant. And uh, so actually the executive director of the resource center did do that. She was really uh, the one that had to do it because all the money really is going to their organization. And so that was uh, submitted by the end of October. So um, anyway, we'll, we won't hear back until early in the new year about whether the township's uh, going to uh, be giving us some money. But in the meantime, we had raised uh, enough money to, uh, uh, to help out with the uh, uh, cost of the, the Indigenous elder for uh, half a year. And, uh, and uh, because the, the resource center had some money uh, as well, then uh, the executive director has uh, gone through a process of trying to locate someone 
And I just got word yesterday that uh, that actually uh, she's found uh, someone that will uh, be taking on this position of uh, Indigenous elder. And so we're quite pleased with that. And I guess, uh, you know, the next thing for us will be uh, to uh, see what the results of the township uh, uh, grant is and, and uh, uh, probably uh, be looking at some uh, other ways to, to raise funds to, to, uh, to help with this initiative. So anyway, thank you for listening. Thank you, Dorothy. And uh, last but not least, we have George Addison in Vineland, Ontario. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is George Addison. I coordinate um, Kairos Niagara, and I edit the, the Facebook page for Kairos Niagara. And it's good to be with you. Uh, we're here on the ancestral territory of the Anishinaabe, Anawandarok, and Haudenosaunee peoples who have been sharing hunting and fishing uh, on this territory for thousands of years under the terms of the One Dish, One Spoon Agreement. I'd like to share a few words about an important uh, issue of Indigenous solidarity in our backyard. I want to tell you about Carl Dockstatter. He's a friend of Kairos here in Niagara. He and his friend Sean Vanderklist do a radio show on CKTV radio on Sunday mornings called One Dish, One Mike, which is also available on their website of the same name. Last April, Kyle and Sean were co-recipients of the 2020 Canadian Journalism Foundation CBC Indigenous Journalism Fellowship Award, which has enabled them to expand and deepen their Indigenous outlook work and get some training in journalism. In the past, Kyle has worked with us. He spoke at a big interfaith event on the treaty background of our area, especially the One Dish, One Spoon wampum. Um, and he also uh, acted as co-leader for a blanket exercise that Kairos Niagara sponsored at the St. Catherine's Market, along with Val Kerr, uh, another Kairos friend who's a Haudenosaunee Anglican priest who's been appointed Archdeacon for Truth and Reconciliation by the Dio Diocese of Niagara. So these are good friends and have really been so helpful to us in our solidarity work here. Carl and Sean have been covering an important indigenous land issue nearby in Haldeman County, where there's been a long-standing dispute over land development near the town of Caledonia. A few months ago, a land developer started work on a new subdivision they call Mackenzie Meadow, except it was in a disputed land, uh, land uh, area. And so uh, a number of uh, a Six Nations Haudenosaunee activists seized the land, which they renamed 1492 Land Back Lane. The developers responded with court injunctions and the OPP has been arresting dozens, actually 33 people altogether of people at the site and actually in their homes and at their workplaces, including our intrepid journalist, Carl Dockstadter. Carl had a terrible time trying to explain it to his children. But he's worked on talking about what the background of this dispute is. This has been a pattern that's been going on regarding the Six Nations people who were given the Haldeman Tract back in the 18th century, which was six miles on either side of the Grand River from its mouth to its source. Um, and that land has been whittled away over the centuries, um, often often uh, illegally. Uh, it goes back to a rather famous name, uh, Samuel Jarvis, who has a street and a school named after him in Toronto and a town in Haldeman County. Um, uh, when when the, the natives complained that uh, white settlers were squatting on their land, he told them that he, they should turn over all their land to the government, uh, which he took for himself and uh, misappropriated uh, uh, over a million pounds, which has never been repaid. But this is a pattern um, that there's a dispute that this particular uh, land back lane uh, dispute goes back to 1995. Um, it's supposed to be just supposed to be heard. It's never heard. And so the developers just go ahead and they start work 
Um, and then if anybody protests, they call the police, uh, get a court injunction and call the police. And that's been the case here. The occupiers have been subject to intimidation, court orders, police violence, and racist attacks by local politicians and white neighbors. One good piece of news most recently is that the band council, which has a different um, position uh, on the, these lands from the, the uh, Confederation, um, uh, is, has been said it's willing to enter into negotiations. But of course, the federal government has done nothing to bring on those negotiations and the provincial government keeps sending in the police and keeps arresting people. It seems to me that we at Kairos can help by educating ourselves on the issues, um, turning to uh, Carl and Carl's uh, uh, webpage, uh, One Dish, One Mic, might be a good start for us to look at the issues. Also, Tanya Kalaga had a column in the Global Mail this morning, which I just read, and it's also a good background um, on the issues. We should also be demanding that the provincial government withdraw the OPP and set aside the unjust court injunctions and criminal charges against the land defenders. The federal government should immediately begin negotiations between itself, the band council, and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chief Council to resolve the matter in nation to nation talks. This is where it has to go. And this seems to be this other pattern and that is just stalling. And we should also join the growing demand that the province drop the charges against our friend Carl Dockstetter so that he can do his job. Thank you, George. I was muted. I forgot to unmute myself. Yes, I read that article in the Globe and Mail this morning. People getting arrested weeks after they were on the site. Uh, one singer who was there to, to sing for one afternoon gets a knock on the door weeks after, which is what prompted uh, Tanya Talaga to write that article. Thank you to all of uh, the speakers. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat box, uh, but there is a comment from Peter Bisson. Uh, I'll read your comment, Peter. I'm delighted to hear so much engagement and solidarity with Indigenous people. The Jesuit Forum for Social Faith and Justice in Toronto will be publishing a very helpful dialogue guide called Listening to Indigenous Voices, a dialogue guide on justice and right relations. And Kairos has been uh, one of your colla collaborators, you say in your article. Uh, thank you, Peter, for that. Um, is, uh, does anyone uh, have any uh, questions they would like to ask right now? Oh, I have one here from uh, David Miller. Could uh, George explain the link between uh, police surveillance and today's arrests? Well, surveillance, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the meaning of the question is, but the, the background of the story is that uh, anybody who's, who's uh, been uh, occupying or visiting the 1492 Landback Lane has uh, been uh, photographed, uh, filmed, um, and their names have been taken down. Uh, and they're subject to, um, to charges because, they're, because an injunction has made any protest illegal on that territory. So the, the provincial courts have decided to intervene in this matter by skewing all things in, in, in defense of the landowners, the, the so-called landowners on this disputed territory. And then sometimes weeks later, uh, Carl was at home with his children. Uh, that is a knock on the door and the police bring charges and tell you to show up in court. Um, and so it, it's been a, a, a pattern that's been around for a very long time, but it's, it's, uh, it's unfair, it's improper, and it needs to stop. Um, we've had a uh, similar uh, occupation on what's called the Douglas Estate, also in Caledonia, a few years ago, where there was also a long dispute, and the provincial government at that time just took over, bought all the land, and set it aside. But again, it's never been... It's never been uh, negotiated over. It's never been resolved. And they're just waiting for another developer to take it over. Thank you. Um, I would like to also say that Shannon has put a few links uh, in the chat box. 
one for Water First, which is the organization that uh, Dave Gordon was telling us about earlier. Another link for the One Dish, One Mic uh, radio station for you to, uh, radio show for you to uh, see as well. So thanks, thanks very much everyone for your presentations. It's uh, really uh, uh, inspiring. I'm going to share my screen again so that we can uh, hear from uh, Shannon. Uh, Shannon has some national announcements to uh, share with us. Um, just to... I'll go on from there. Um, so Shannon, please uh, go ahead and share with us. Thanks very much, Elaine. Um, for taking some time. And thank you all to all of the speakers today, especially all of our network uh, speakers. It's great to hear all that is going on in your various locations uh, across the provinces. And um, I learned all kinds of things that I didn't know today about the different in, um, initiatives that you are involved with. So um, just great appreciation for all of that effort and for your coming to share them with us all. So um, I wanted to tell you a, about a few things that the Kairos National Office is uh, promoting and some resources that are available for you. So I will, um, without further introduction, I. Of uh, myself, I will go on to the, the next slide. And this is an invitation. Kairos is excited to invite you to join us at our upcoming, that is just next week, Women of Courage, Women, Peace and Security, South South Gathering. Um, so you might be wondering about this name. I think many of you will know that Kairos has this Women of Courage program has been going on for more than a decade. But in the last couple of years, we've specifically had a program called Women, Peace and Security that is partially funded by the government and partially funded with help from folks like you um, through Kairos. And this is a gathering of four different partners um, from the global south. And so when those partners come together, we call it a south south gathering. And that is one of the unique aspects of this particular program is that it's not just about Canada and Colombia or Canada and uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, it is about Colombia and the DRC. Um, it's about South Sudan together with the West Bank and how these folks are um, in solidarity with each other and growing and learning together and in their work for justice. So you are all invited to a public event. They are having three days of meetings together and they are setting aside a couple of hours for all of us to listen. It will feature these partners, uh, the Organización Femenina Popular in Colombia, RTA de la Justice in the DRC, the South Sudan Council of Churches National Women's Program, and WEAM, Palestinian Conflict Transformation Center in the West Bank. Um, the partners and their beneficiaries, because it's on um, online, we uh, they are able to invite some of their their program participants to share stories of courage and change from their experiences working for an inclusive, equitable, and just peace in very fragile contexts. So I have a, um, a link here I'm gonna share with you to register and uh, invite you all to be present next week. So we could go on to the next one while I just pop this in the chat here. Hopefully many of you know about For the Love of Creation. Now I'm gonna make my slide really small on my screen. 
and look at you folks. Let's have a show of hands of who has heard about For the Love of Creation before. Just wave like this. Excellent, excellent. So most of you probably know that uh, For the Love of Creation is um, an interfaith uh, creation care or um, climate justice initiative. And we've been doing uh, a fall forum series. There were five of them all together. There are two left every Monday evening in November. So um, the one this coming Monday will all be about how we can develop our theology of climate justice together. Uh, creation care, a letter of the faithful. It's an invitation from For the Love of Creation to all of us to get into groups and we're gonna try out some of it, learn some of it on Monday to talk about our own theologies of uh, climate justice, creation care, and then as a group across the nation to put together uh, this theology. And then the following week will be about act, taking action. And so we will uh, have a motivational speaker, but also a opportunity again to work in groups and to actually take action together. Another resource that I want to tell you about is the um, Faithful Climate Conversations. Let's have the next slide. Um, this also comes from For the Love of Creation and is a resource to help you um, bring conversations about the climate to your community, whoever that might be. So whether that's your neighbors, your family, um, or the people in your congregation, we invite you to check out the website and um, the events and all of the resources that are available there. Moving right along to another resource, we could have the next slide for the um, epiphany resource. This is a piece that Kairos puts out each year. And so we'd invite you to pick it up yourself and use it. It could be used for um, any sort of personal or group devotions in the season of Epiphany in particular, but you might find it useful at any time. It follows the lectionary scriptures and um, We'd also encourage you to let your um, pastors, ministers, worship committees know about this resource. Uh, the focus this year is in good news stories around climate justice. And so um, quite excited to share some of those with you alongside the scriptures that tell us the good news of the gospel. And I'll just share how you find that as well. I should have sent these off to Elaine before in the advance, but I didn't. Um, so Kathleen gave us uh, a great uh, introduction to the KBE teaching and sharing circles. I won't say more about that except to let you know that um, a whole series of them is being planned for 2021. So while registration is full at the moment, uh, you will get your opportunity next year. And also to let you know that the virtual Kairos blanket exercise is um, in the works and will also be released next year. So I um, wanted to just remind you that we covet your support in a whole variety of ways. And I wanted to read this quote for you. Um, Cheryl says, I chose Kairos to receive gifts in honor of my birthday because I want those gifts to have a positive lasting impact in the world and not to contribute to unnecessary consumption of resources. 
So I just encourage you as we come towards the end of the year, there will be all kinds of reminders sent to you as you're on Kairos lists, but that we um, look for your prayers, we look for your advocacy, we look for your time, and we also look for your financial support. And so whatever it is you can offer into our joint work of justice seeking, we welcome that and uh, thank you for it. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Shannon. Um, we've come to the end of the forum and uh, I want to uh, thank everyone for participating. And I would like to end with a uh, prayer. Um, so uh, let's close with this reflection. May the universal spirit bless us with discomfort at easy answers half-truths, and superficial relationships so that we may live deep within our hearts. May the universal spirit bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we may work for economic justice for all people. May the universal spirit bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, hunger, homelessness, and rejection so that we may reach out our hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may the universal spirit bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in the world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done. This is from the Marianist Social Justice Collaborative. Thank you very much everyone uh, for having spent these last two hours with us.